I'd like to welcome you uh, to our last series of uh, noon lectures this quarter. Uh, today's speaker is going to give a uh, sh very short speech, and we have a very exciting film, which I'm looking forward to see. And then he'll be glad to answer any of your questions. Our guest to, to campus today is one of America's most foremost heart surgeons. He has uh, won just about every honor and every award that a, a doctor can win. He has pioneered the use of artificial uh, implantation of uh, parts around the heart and in the, uh, the transplant area. And uh, he's written over 800 publications for scientific uh, magazines. Just a remarkable person. And as I said, America's foremost heart surgeon, Dr. Michael E. DeBakey. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I must uh, first express to you my uh, grateful appreciation for the opportunity of being with you. This working all right? Can you hear me in the back? Is it all right? Good. Now, what I uh, have selected to discuss with you today, the topic I've selected is every man's responsibility, following which I will show this movie and uh, narrate it for you. Uh, but first, I, uh, I wanted to make this statement to you to express some thoughts that I have. Uh, I have borrowed the title of a well-known medieval morality play to speak to you today about every man's responsibility to himself and to society. The responsibility to improve the quality of life and some of the ways that this can be done in an era of rapid, complex, social, scientific, and technologic changes. Today's students are the best informed, most articulate, most thoughtful, and most socially conscious of all times. And I am sure most of you have given some serious thought to your responsibility in life. I shall try, therefore, not to offend you by offering neat solutions or speaking in meaningless cliches. But I hope that my comments may stimulate you to take positive action about your future and perhaps dispel some of the sense of frustration, alienation, and cynicism that disenchantment with cont contemporary life may have produced. First, may I speak briefly about the ubiquitous, ubiquitous word today, dissent, which has become a pastime for the pseudo-social. The right to dissent is inherent in the American tradition. Most reform, in fact, arises from dissatisfaction. But dissent, for the sake of dissent, to be fashionable or to appear intellectually superior, is not only fatuous, it is pernicious. It can lead to irrational behavior and social disintegration. On the other hand, calm, rational dissent with a clearly defined, laudable purpose can initiate constructive change for the benefit of all. The name of the game today is anti-establishment, which carried to its extreme becomes nihilism, the doctrine that demands complete destruction of the current system. Fortunately, the irrational, undisciplined, malvolent forces on campus today, although highly vociferous and much publicized by the news media, constitute a minority. Most college students recognize the need to present their grievances in sane, logical terms, not in loud profanities and obscenities, the last resort of the intellectually and linguistically destitute. To move forward effectively, I think we need to dispose of the idea that change requires dissolution of the present system. From a practical standpoint, this is folly. We simply cannot rebuild fast enough to make total eradication prudent. How much wiser to retain the good while we are correcting the bad? 
I cannot believe that there is nothing worth salvaging in our present social, political, and educational institutions, when not only are we among the most enlightened nation in the world, but our standard of living is among the highest. To be sure, there is still much to correct and improve. But where else is there as much freedom of opportunity for those who seriously want to make a contribution? Chaos and violence, the companions of destructiveness, are a painful and circuitous route to amelioration, if indeed they lead there at all. Certainly they deter us from our goals by suppressing creativity, imagination, and ingenuity. We must also guard against unreasonable aspirations and expectations, lest our disappointment turn to cynicism and apathy. If, on the other hand, we are willing to establish a realistic objective and to effect change one step at a time, we can approach our goal in a sane, orderly, tranquil manner with minimum disruption of stabilizing forces in society. Toppling the establishment may mo momentarily relieve frustration, but making enduring improvements is a long, laborious process. We must resist the temptation to find superficial solutions and must meet setbacks with resiliency rather than despair. The threshold of maturity has always been a stage of questioning, dissent, and even rebellion and the university campus has traditionally been a strong catalyst for such activity. Human creativity and ingenuity crave expression, and every age has even fashioned its own lexicon, dress, literature, art, and music. Today's students are more aware of socioeconomic forces and are more immersed in public policy than ever before. They are far less frivolous than their predecessors, they are arriving earlier on the political scene and are becoming active participants in community programs for social improvement of deprived and neglected segments of our society. Participating actively in the struggle for a noble cause is indeed exhilarating. This activism, I view, is a healthy rather than a harmful sign, an in index of our young people's willingness indeed eagerness to assume their responsibilities as citizens. It is, their, it is the direction of this activism, it is the direction that this active, activism takes that will determine its salutary or destructive effect. You see much in the world today that disturbs you, impersonal, obsolescent, or impotent ins institutions, social injustice, ignorance, poverty, hunger, disease, war, crime, violence, urban blight, and you want to re reshape the world to remove these ills. You are impatient to do this, and you are disenchanted with your elders' apparent insens insensitivity to these evils. You yearn to exert control over your own destiny. Implicit in the creed of the now generation is an inordinate emphasis on instantaneity. Instant food, instant pleasure, instant learning, instant obliteration of evil, instant change. Modern science and technology can often accelerate change in physical phenomena, but phenomena that have intellectual and emotional ingredients and that may have been genera generations in evolving cannot be changed overnight. People simply do not readily relinquish deeply entrenched attitudes and beliefs. As members of society, you certainly have a responsibility to keep under, under constant surveillance all social and political institutions and to effect changes in those that are outmoded, detrimental, or ineffective. To do this intelligent, intelligently, you must define your goals against a set of human values. The American ideal gives high priority to justice, liberty, dignity, opportunity, and brotherhood. These are the values that give life meaning. But we must do more than pay lip homage to a group of abstract words. We must convert these abstractions into reality by incorporating them into our institutions and our daily conduct. In designing a better society and a more purposeful life, we must give top priority to fulfillment of the individual. We must make certain that every human being has a, pre a prerequisite for fulfillment. First, good health. 
that is, adequate nutrition, shelter, and protection against accident and disease. We must provide every person with an opportunity to gain a livelihood, to acquire the knowledge and skills that will permit him to maintain a decent standard of living. We must encourage the fullest possible intellectual and aesthetic development of every citizen. The great tragedy of ignorance lies in the needless waste of human potential that is a universal loss. We must preserve self-esteem by instilling in every human being a sense of his responsibility and worth and a desire for excellence. Only those who are not afraid of demanding the best of themselves and of course can and, other, and of others can save a civilization from mediocrity. We must preserve freedom of thought and expression and movement, freedom that subsumes responsibility. Finally, we need to exercise mercy and compassion from a deep sense of the brotherhood of man and not simply give Tartuffian acquiescence to a venerable slogan. In each of, if each of us will work towards these social ideals, we can ensure not only to ourselves, but for everyone a full, productive, satisfying life. But you will have to set specific goals early and prepare to pursue them with determination. Let me cite examples from my own field, medical science. The scientist's goal is to find truth, which he pursues with certain intellectual, ethical, and moral codes. He reveres honesty, tolerance, freedom of thought and speech, human life and dignity and justice. The scientific process of inquiry and discovery is like the artistic process, a creative one, that may result in a new concept, a relation, experiment, or product. The scientist's fulfillment comes in the knowledge that he is putting to use a fully developed potential and that his discovery is of service to mankind. Medical science is dedicated specifically to the, pre to the prevention of disease, the relief of suffering and disability, and the prolongation of life. These are particularly rewarding goals for they allow tangible evidence of achievement. It is an excellent example, too, of collaborative endeavor, of many working contemporaneously and successively toward a common goal of improving the quality of life. Physicians have always translated the newest scientific discoveries into practical benefits for their patients, and these benefits have prompted further exploration, society demanding and expecting even better health care. New knowledge thus acts as a stimulus for further research which in turn yields additional new knowledge. From incredibly crude beginnings, medical scientists have added fact to fact to provide incalculable benefits to humanity. Go back about 150 years and the lifespan was only 35 years, one half of what it is today. Go back about 100 years and anesthesia was unknown. Go back about 50 and pneumonia was fatal. Today, most serious infectious, infectious diseases, such as tuberculosis, smallpox, diphtheria, tetanus, and poliomyelitis, have been eradicated or controlled. The discovery of radium by the Curies and the Röntgen ray by Röntgen opened an entirely new approach to the diagnosis and treatment of disease. In the field of cancer, researchers have made tremendous strides. Almost a million and a half Americans who have had a major form of cancer are now leading productive, happy lives. Today, in fact, one in every three Americans with cancer survives the disease, as compared with one in every four only a few years ago. In psychiatry, advances have been revolutionary. The shift from brutal to humane treatment of the mentally and emotionally ill has been accompanied by major contributions in the form of effective drugs for anxiety and depression and successful treatment for other forms of related disturbances. Many patients have resumed normal, productive lives in their own communities rather than being sentenced to morbid institutional existences. As a result, the number of patients in state mental in hospitals has been reduced by more than 100,000 during the past decade alone. The collaboration of bioengineers with medical scientists has made possible phenomenal advances, including detection of illnesses, through use of isotopes and ultrasonics and implantation of miniature pacemakers to regulate the beat of the heart. 
Medical science even finds beneficial uses for such frightening products of scientific research as atomic energy. This dis discovery created a new field of nuclear medicine, which has produced the cobalt teletherapy machine for treatment of cancer and radioisotope techniques for diagnosis by scanning and tracer studies and for treatment for such diseases as hypothyroidism. New medical applications are being found for the laser, including therapeutic coagulation of detached retinas and destruction of certain chromosomes. Picture phones will soon bring in instantly to the specialist a patient's rec medical record, including an electrocardiogram, electroencephalogram, rentgenogram, and other recordings from widely disparate ge geographic sites. In my own field of cardiovascular disease, more progress has been made during the past 15 years than in all of previous recorded history. Within the past decade alone, the overall death rate from hypertension, high blood pressure, which affects more than 17 million Americans, has been reduced by 46 percent, primarily as a result of the development of more effective drugs. Impressive reductions have also occurred in rheumatic heart disease and in stroke, particularly among those under 65 years of age. In my career as a heart surgeon, I have seen unprecedented advances in the treatment of many grave forms of heart disease. The development of the heart-lung machine, a product of the research laboratory, opened the field of open-heart surgery and for the first time permitted direct attack on this vital organ. With the circulation thus supported mechanically, the surgeon could succeed, <coughs> could, <coughs> could proceed to repair the diseased heart or segment of the circulatory system. Today, we can correct most forms of congenital heart disease, as well as many acquired forms. For centuries, aneurysms, the ballooning out of arteries, which led ultimately to rupture and death, have challenged physicians. Medical research has met this challenge with the development of synthetic materials, such as Dacron, to replace the diseased arteries. Valvular heart disease, formerly fatal or crippling, can now be corrected surgically by replacement of the defective valves. The concept of autoimmune disease paved the way for tissue and organ transplantation, not only of the cornea, cartilage, nerve, bone, and endocrine glands, but most recently of the heart. While scientists are working diligently to solve the problem of rejection, investigators in other laboratories are vigorously pursuing the development of the artificial heart. Such a device is not merely a fanciful idea. Replacing the pumping func function of the heart has already proved feasible and this research will ultimately reach full fruition. Already, mechanical cardiac assisters are successfully assuming partial, temporary pumping of blood while the diseased biologic heart is permitted to recuperate. Many of these realities of medical science and technology were considered only a quarter of a century ago to be capricious ideas of visionaries. Even now, we are on the threshold of a biomedical revolution with the key to life and the genetic code of cellular biology and function close within our reach. But with all this progress, there is still much to be done. The social impact of medical research is overwhelming. And for those with a scientific bent, the challenges are endless for making a real contribution to humanity. The true medical scientist, dealing as he does with human life, is keenly aware of his moral responsibilities and is guided in his work by professional ethical codes. But he must stand ready, as we all must, to re-examine his values and his codes periodically as new knowledge and new circumstances require. The moral, ethical, theologic, and legal aspects of organ transplantation, about which you've heard so much recently, have long been thoughtfully considered by medical research scientists engaged in such research. Science and technology have repaid man for his investments with improved health, comfort, and well-being. They have contributed to man's respect for order, his enjoyment of beauty, his perception of meaning, and his discovery of truth. The ancient evils of hunger, poverty, ignorance, and disease, which are today creating so much social turbulence, can be further alleviated through science. Through science, too, we can conquer new problems. The population dilemma, with its threat of inadequate food and water, environmental pollution, and undeveloped human intellect and skills. I believe that with proper education and enlightenment, society will exercise discretion and constraint in ensuring that scientific discoveries 
are used for benevolent purposes only. And it is the responsibility, the responsibility of every man to see that it does. To discharge this responsibility, he must not allow fear of the potential destructive uses of science to deter his research for new knowledge, for ignorance is perhaps the worst of all fates. We must instead strive to achieve the wisdom needed to use our knowledge benevolently. Only if freed from prejudice, fear, and superstition can man achieve a life of physical comfort and spiritual serenity for himself and his brothers. Helping to achieve such a world, such a world is every man's responsibility. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if I may uh, have the film, I'll try to uh, exemplify some of what I've tried to say to you in terms of medical sciences uh, activities in discharging this kind of responsibility. We have the film. This film, and by the way, uh, if there's anyone here that is a little squeamish about uh, seeing uh, the beating heart or seeing an incision made to expose the uh, vital structures of the body, uh, I suggest that you uh, uh, leave the room because uh, I would hate to have anybody here faint watching this film. And since I've had this experience uh, previously, I'm uh, sort of alerting you to that possibility, those of you that may be uh, unable to, uh, to watch this. I think for the rest of you that it will be interesting to see how this is done, to, in a sense, uh, come into the operating room and get a glimpse of what we do uh, and uh, how this is uh, achieved. Uh, I'll narrate the film as we go along and try to tell you where you are and what we're doing. You want to move this? Yeah, all right. Is it working now? Yes, I guess it is. Now what you're going to see here, go ahead and with the film and I'll proceed with uh, the narration of it. Uh, if you can darken the room a little bit more, I think it'll show a little better. Because it's in color. Uh, this film will show the application of transplantation and the transplant, uh, transplantation technique to uh, several pr uh, types of procedures. One is uh, the transplantation of two kidneys. Uh, you'll see one of them being done. The other one is similar, of course. Uh, the, a lung and uh, a heart. Uh, it so happened that this film was made at a time when we had the good fortune to uh, have four patients in the hospital who uh, were of the same type uh, and that matched this donor. So we took advantage of this opportunity to transplant these various organs. This, of course, is one of the limitations of transplantation, that is, the donor availability. It restricts greatly the, the uh, application of the procedure. Uh, an important consideration in this whole transplantation field is the, uh, the research that's done to try to understand better, and uh, this requires teamwork. And what uh, is uh, being shown here on the screen is an effort to demonstrate the 
the various scientific disciplines uh, that must be represented along with the surgeon uh, since he's only one member of the team uh, and uh, uh, this simply compares the number of recipients with the, uh, the number of donors far greater demand of course for transplanting organs than, uh, than we have donor availability now uh, the the purpose of the program is, of course, to to provide uh, new knowledge, and that's therefore to do research, and secondly, to uh, help the patient. The most donors, and this uh, shows this type, this donor was uh, a patient who uh, attempted suicide and and succeeded. Uh, and you see here the X-ray of the skull showing the bullet uh, in the brain that uh, caused his death. Uh, we had two patients who had lost both of their kidneys, that's what bilateral nephrectomies mean, uh, a patient who had severe emphysema and uh, was uh, perfectly miserable, uh, unable to breathe adequately and uh, constantly short of breath, and a patient with severe coronary artery disease who had severe pain from his coronary artery disease, what we call angina, and uh, required uh, a transplant if anything was going to be done on him. These waves that you see are the waves of the electroencephalogram, and gradually, as the as the patient dies and there's brain death, particularly, uh, those waves become flattened out, and they're called isoelectric. This simply illustrates the uh, organization of the operating room setup for the procedure with uh, four operating room. Uh, teams, uh, surgical teams available, uh, fi uh, actually five, including the donor. Now, when we transplant a kidney, uh, we transplant the kidney from one side, that is to say the right kidney, on to the left side of the, of the body and the recipient. And then the left kidney that was taken from the donor is transplanted to the right side. It's put in at a lower level because it's easier technically to do it than in the normal place for the kidney. Now there you see the uh, kidney that was removed from the donor and is now being transplanted. And what we do is sew the, the artery and the vein to, of the kidney to the uh, patient's arteries and veins. And what you're seeing now is the vein of the kidney being sewn attached by what we call anastomosis, uh, by a thread, a suture to the uh, vein of the recipient. As soon as that's completed, then uh, we'll attach the artery, and you should see that in just a moment. The artery is <coughs> after this is completed. And there you see the artery of the kidney being sewn to the artery of the recipient. And this is what we call an end-to-end -end anastomosis. The, the fine thread that's used to do this uh, is made out of Dacron. You see it's, been, it's completed now, and you can see that the artery is beating. Blood's flowing uh, into that kidney from the patient. Uh, then we attach the ureter to the bladder. Uh, and again, uh, this is done by sewing the edges of the opening of the ureter to, within, to an opening within the bladder. And that completes the operation of transplantation of the kidney. Uh, one kidney can be transplanted and serve uh, to function satisfactorily uh, so that you don't really need two kidneys. Uh, one kidney can do the function, uh, the vital function of the body quite adequately. That simply closes over the, what we call the peritoneum uh, over that kidney. And then we close the incision. Now, we've had considerable experience with kidney transplants and since the first kidney transplant was done almost 15 years ago. Uh, and we know something about uh, the experience there. Uh, this uh, diagram really illustrates how we remove the heart. Uh, you see, we cut the heart out uh, by preserving uh, the two major vessels of the heart, uh, what we call the aorta and the pulmonary artery and we preserve the uh, uh, attachment of the two main chambers, collecting chambers of the heart, we call the right and left atrium. 
Um, <coughs> and then we remove the lung in the manner shown diagrammatically here. Now, in a moment, you'll see the incision that's made to expose the chest. Now, this patient is asleep. He can't feel this. There's no pain or anything uh, involved, so uh, he's under anesthesia. Uh, this shows the very badly diseased lung in that patient. It's, it's, it's what we call emphysematous lung. This is due to the fact that the air cells in the lung are markedly dilated, and uh, the lung becomes stiff and it doesn't uh, function well. Uh, ultimately, uh, the patient simply can't get enough air. He can't, uh, he's, he's breathless. Uh, now, we're, attached, we're putting a clamp on the, one of the main arteries that supplies blood to that lung, called the pulmonary artery. You can see the heart beating in the background. Uh, we'll take this out. We'll cut it out, you see. We're cutting out this diseased lung. Now it's been removed, and we're trimming the main artery. There's an artery and a vein that we have to trim and attach. The lung, the new lung, will be attached to, to this. And you'll see in a moment, uh, we sew this. It's just being trimmed now so as to provide a good attachment. Now we're sewing the artery of that lung to the artery of the patient. And when that's done, we'll sew the vein of the lung to the vein of the patient. And then we have one other attachment to make, and that's the, the bronchus, which is the airway uh, into the lung. And there's the bronchus where we will attach that. That's the airway from the uh, to the right lung. You see, I mean the left lung. So, from a technical standpoint, this is a relatively simple operation. Well, I, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm I'm serious about this from our standpoint. Uh, technically, this is not a uh, what we would call a difficult operation. There are many operations uh, on the heart and the lungs that are more difficult than this. Now it's completed and you see the expansion of that lung. Now that's a normal lung. And uh, perhaps you can see the difference in the way it appears uh, grossly uh, with the lung that we removed. We close the incision and uh, put these tubes in the chest to get rid of the air and the secretions for the first 24 hours. Now we're exposing the heart of the patient who, who, uh, whose heart is badly diseased. And that's the, uh, what we call a pericardial sac that surrounds the heart that's open, opening, being opened now. And you see that heart, that's a badly diseased heart. In fact, uh, uh, fortunately, we, what we're doing now is, is putting the tubes into the artery and in and into the vein in a moment, you'll see the vein, the tube going into the vein. Uh, and we will connect those tubes to the heart-lung machine and thus shunt the blood from the heart. The blood that would normally go to the heart will be shunted by means of these tubes into the heart-lung machine. And the heart-lung machine will take over the function of the heart and the lungs temporarily. So you see, we have, we're using an artificial heart uh, for a short period of time. Now that tubing will shunt the blood from the upper part of the body, and diagrammatically you'll see how this functions. The blood that would normally come to the heart is taken away by means of those tubes and directed to the artificial heart-lung machine where it's oxygenated and then it's pumped back into the body through one of the main arteries. And that provides for maintenance of uh, viability of the body while the heart is being removed. We do the same thing when we work on the inside of the heart. There you see a view of the operating room with the heart-lung machine and blood now coming into the uh, heart-lung machine and you can see it gradually uh, filling it up and uh, taking over. Now we're ready to take that heart out. It actually uh, uh, began to fail right on the operating table. Uh, couldn't take the stress of the operation, but we were on the heart-lung machine, so it didn't matter. 
<coughs> we are removing this very badly diseased heart for which nothing can be done except replacement. There's no drugs, no method of treatment that can save that heart or repair it in any way. And these patients uh, would die if nothing else could be done for them in a relatively short period of time. We're just cutting the attachment of the heart away now. And you can see the base of the chamber, what we call the collecting chamber, the uh, atrium, the right atrium there. There's a right atrium and a left atrium. That there is diagrammatically, you see what, what it looks like. The one on your right is the left atrium. The one on your left is the right atrium. The right atrium collects the blood, the venous blood, that comes from the rest of the body after it has circulated through the body. Now, what you see here is uh, the donor's heart that's been removed and the way we prepare it for uh, anastomosis. Uh, we trim it and uh, fix it in such a way that it makes the sewing of that, uh, those two chambers, the right and left atrium, uh, easier to the uh, attachment uh, and the chambers that are left in the patient after the heart's been removed. And you see what we're doing now is trimming that. That's the donor's heart. This has been now being prepared for anastomosis. And that'll be sewn by the same kind of suture that you saw a moment ago. And what we do is use a fine thread. Incidentally, that thread is made out of Dacron because we found that uh, this is tolerated better and lasts longer and is stronger, holds better. This is the way we sew it, you see. We sew the attachment of the new heart to the base of the uh, old heart that's been removed. And we're beginning that suture now, putting it in, and now sewing it to the new heart. Now we, uh, we have uh, had, uh, of course, a considerable amount of technical experience in doing this before since this has been done on animals, many animals, and we know how to do it from a technical standpoint. And you'll see again that it's a relatively simple operation to do uh, from a technical standpoint because <coughs> it's pretty straightforward. Uh, there are any number of heart operations that we do that are far more complicated and difficult technically than this operation. The main problem, um, there are two main problems in heart transplantation at the present time. One is the availability of donors. We're just sewing now. One is the availability of donors, and that's limited because First, you have to have uh, an individual that is relatively young and healthy uh, who is killed either by an accident or uh, by some form of violence or by a form of disease that uh, doesn't affect the rest of the body, doesn't affect the heart. Well, this limits, of course, the availability of donors. Secondly, the donor must match properly with the recipient that's available at the time. The other main problem is, of course, rejection. Now, we've not solved the rejection phenomena. We do have ways and means of controlling it to some extent, suppressing it, but not eliminating it. And the great majority of deaths that have taken place in following heart transplantation have been due either to the rejection or to the effort to suppress the rejection, resulting in uncontrollable infection. Now, we've completed the uh, anastomosis of the right uh, atrial chamber. Now we're going to anastomose the left atrial chamber. And we do that in much the same way. The heart's lifted up, and then we just attach the ends of the donor's heart, the edges of that donor heart, to the edge of the recipient's uh, heart that <coughs> remains. And what you're looking into now is the cavity you're looking into is the left atrium. 
And as I indicated before, the left atrium is a collecting chamber for the blood that comes, that has been oxygenated and is returned to the heart from the lung. Now, once we've completed this, we will attach the ends of the pulmonary artery. There are two vessels here, the pulmonary artery and the aorta. The pulmonary artery is the artery that uh, provides for the conduit of, uh, for blood to go from the heart to the lung. So as blood is pumped from the right side of the heart to the lung uh, to be oxygenated, it goes through that pulmonary artery. So that's what we're doing. We're attaching that. And we do that in the same way, you see, with a suture that is uh, used as a continuous, through and through type of suture, a very simple kind of a stitch. The, uh, the need to continue our research in this area, of course, is obvious since the challenge of rejection is still to be fully met. Uh, I think we're making some progress in this area, but we've got a considerable ways to go before we will have solved it. Now we're ready to attach the aorta. Now the aorta is the main uh, sort of line uh, for arterialized blood to go to the body. It's the big artery that comes out of the heart, and it's the artery that uh, permits blood to flow out of the left ventricle into the heart. Now, you're going to see something here in a minute. I want you to call your attention to it. You see little blood's coming out of that opening. We've allowed blood to go into the heart now in order to displace the air in the heart. And you'll see in just a moment that that heart will start beating very feebly at first. If you look closely, you'll see it. Now you see it beating. And then we'll take the clamp off the aorta, allow blood to be to go into the coronary arteries of that new heart and revive it. And it'll start beating, and you see it beating now. And then in a little while, within five, ten minutes, it'll take over completely the normal circulation and will beat forcefully enough to allow us to come off of the heart-lung machine. And now you see we're taking the tube out of the heart -lung, for the heart-lung machine. And we're ready to close the incision. That heart's now taken over completely. It's providing an adequate uh, blood pressure and adequate blood flow to maintain viability. And then we just close the incision. Now, the, the, of the four patients that had these four organ transplants, this is one of the kidney patients who has survived and done well and is still doing fine. This is nearly six months since his operation. The other, other patient was a, a man, of, uh, older man of about 55, who had ser severe heart disease as well and subsequently had a heart attack and died. Now the lung patient, the x-ray is shown here showing that that lung looks fine and is functioning well and did function well for about three weeks. Then he developed a serious infection, an unusual type of infection, what we call herpes, uh, pneumonia. Herpes is a thing that produces uh, fever blisters and died from that. Now this shows the what we call the coronary arteriogram where we inject dye into the coronary arteries and you see it's perfectly normal. This is the heart patient. He's still doing fine. He's now at, back at home, has resumed his normal occupation, normal work, and you see him here on the golf course in Arizona where he played. <laughs> Obviously hasn't helped his golf game. Well, I think that uh, completes the uh, film. Now, where do we stand in this area? Well, as I said before, uh, we stand at the moment at the point of being able to do the operation technically, uh, having partial success with a small proportion of patients that uh, are relieved and are doing well for, sh for periods of months. How, m how long they'll continue to do well, we, are, we of course, do not have that information yet, time will tell. We still have a very serious rejection problem to control. We have a limitation in the application of the procedure because of donor availability. And for this reason, of course, uh, we are stressing the, the work, the research work on the artificial heart. Hopefully that uh, we will be able to develop one that will replace the normal heart. 
But our main thrust is to um, continue the research work to have, an, uh, to have a better understanding of the cause of most of these, which is arteriosclerosis, and ultimately to solve that problem. Because with the solution of the cause of most of these heart diseases, we should then be able to eliminate the need for heart replacement. And this, of course, is the ultimate goal. Now, I am, again, uh, want to express to you my very grateful appreciation of being with you. And if you want to have a question and answer period now or later. All right. Good. Many, a lot of people now have to go to one o'clock class, but some of you stay, and I'll just right. ask them to get up a little closer. Okay. Uh -huh. We realize that many of you are going to one o'clock classes. If you do have questions, please move up closer in the front, and uh, Dr. DeBake, you will try to answer them, any of them you have. We'll wait, we'll wait just a couple minutes for the, for the noise to die down and the people who have their classes to leave. Beg your speech? Beg pardon? Can I get a copy of your speech? Uh, that's the only copy I have, but uh, I'm going to make it available uh, if you would like to write. Is the mint on Joe Pat? Is there anybody in there? Because we were just planning to stay in here. <laughs> no. I think people can just stand up in here. And uh, so the, the basic principle of doing it is very much similar to the type of matching this time for a blood transfusion. Possibly, if you if you just hold the mic, oh, and we right. can just you know if these people just want to stand here. And oh, whatever you like to do. Uh, uh, I'm glad to. Do you have any questions? How long uh, how long ago did they start actually experimenting with animals? When did it, uh, when did that take place? Oh, that began a long long time ago. Off and on, we've been experimenting with animal transplantation. Did you use for, the mic? There's yeah. Some people in the back. Uh, we began doing you know transplantation of uh, various organs. Uh, oh, more than 50 years ago. Uh, this is not a new concept, but there was no way to control the rejection phenomenon until relatively recently when we began to develop, within the past decade, various uh, drugs that did affect the, uh, the immune mechanism and suppressed it so that you didn't have the rejection take place regularly. And uh, while we have not solved it, we have made some progress in suppressing it. Why long can you, uh, why don't you do it to say the question on the mic? How long is the heart out of the donor before it actually starts pumping again in the... Uh, well, we... Uh, how, long, how long can the heart uh, be outside the body, you mean? Right. And how, how about the nerves which stimulate the heart to move again? Yes. Well, those are two questions. First, in regard to how long it can be outside the body, uh, usually we, we uh, will do the operation in certainly less than an hour after it's been removed. Um, this operation took about 35 minutes. Um, now, we have ways and means of, of, of keeping the heart alive after removing it, and we've, we have done this experimentally up to 24 hours. Um, now, as far as the nerve uh, connections are concerned, uh, it's denovated. It's the nerve, there are no nerve connections now to this new transplanted heart. But uh, our experience would suggest that uh, uh, this doesn't interfere with the 
the, uh, let's say, pa local pacing of the heart. And secondly, uh, while it doesn't allow the heart to change its uh, output very much, uh, it's relatively fixed, um, this doesn't interfere with the normal activity. In other words, the output of the heart is adequate for uh, relatively normal activities, <coughs> such as you saw this patient doing. But it, it will not respond to the strenuous activity uh, that a, an innovated heart will do. Normally, for example, the heart can respond by increasing its output 10 times uh, in terms of strenuous activity. But this heart won't do that. But it doesn't seem to be necessary for ordinary activity. Now, he can't run a 100 mile, I mean, a 100 yard dash. But he can play golf, you see. Um, during the uh, film on the uh, kidney transplant, during the kidney transplant, you said that the uh, uh, kidney from the donor was taken from the left, say, the left side, mm -hmm. the right side of the yeah. recipient. Yeah, that's because technically it's easier to do. Oh, just just because of uh, surgical techniques. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. How about? <laughs> Go ahead. Home secretary, plastic surgery. Um, in all the operations that you and Dr. Cooley have done, what has been your average pump time on all the cases you've done? What time? Pump time. Uh, I would say that it averages about to between 30 and 35 minutes. <laughs> well, in most of our operations on uh, open heart surgery, our average pump time is uh, less than an hour, I'd say. Very, very few operations we do with a pump time of an hour. For example, we'll, I, I often do a double valve, an aortic and mitral valve replacement in less than an hour, 50 minutes, pump time. Pump time. Mm -hmm. and, and totally, how long would it take you? Oh, uh, two hours altogether. Double valve? Yeah, sure. I, I do seven, eight, nine operations a day. Those many pumps a day? No, not all of them pumps, but... but uh, uh, they're all vascular, cardiovascular cases. And your scrub nurses stay with you, huh? <laughs> sure. Of course they stay with us. They'll stay with us if we get through. <laughs> How about the pacemakers when you transplant the heart? Is that incorporated? It's, it's incorporated. I see. Yeah. And you do much pacemaker implantation? Yes, we do. I see. What not on these transplants. We've not, we've not had any, no. Just, uh, For Stokes Adams syndrome, we'll do a pacemaker. Just, is that the only thing? For tachycardias and arrhythmias? Well, not tachycardias, for just the opposite. For, uh, is that one of the reasons for using pacemaker? Not tachycardia. Tachycardia is a very rapid pacing. Uh, now we can use drugs to control most of those. Well, I thought Justice Douglas had a tachycardia that was. No, he had Stokes Adams type of syndrome. Or the heart. Well, yes, it's a, it's an, it's a condition in which the heart will beat, say, 30, 40 times a minute instead of uh, 130. Attack cardia, you'll have 130, 140, 150. That's hard, hard block. Yes. Big pardon. We hear of cancer of the liver and the lungs. Yes. We don't hear of a cancer of the heart. Is there something within the heart that would reject a cancer? No, it can occur, and it does occur, but it's very uncommon. It, I say it can occur, and it does occur, but it's very uncommon. We don't know why. That uh, black material in the lung which was transplanted, is that due to the tars and so forth as a result of smoking? It's obviously this man was a smoker, was he not? The black he was a smoker, but uh, I would say that... Uh, in any adult uh, in this uh, day and age, unless he's living in, been living in the country, you know, he'll find, you'll find that whether he smokes or not. Due to the smog. Yeah, you know, air pollution. That's right. Do you think that the development of the artificial heart will eventually uh, replace his need for transplantation? I think so, yes. Oh, sorry. How long? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, that's hard to say because um, I had hoped we'd have it by this time. But this depends upon uh, how much research we do, and uh, I think the research programs all over the country have been slowed down by the lack of funds. What is the main 
The main problem is uh, what we call the interface problem or the materials problem, and that is the uh, effect of uh, blood upon, I mean, effect, uh, the, the effect upon the blood that takes place in terms of degradation of uh, proteins and, uh, and this destruction of the cellular elements, the red cells and the white cells and the platelets. When blood go comes in contact with any surface other than its normal surface, and uh, while we can um, use materials and uh, surfaces that uh, will reduce this, that is minimize it, for relatively short periods, up to maybe 10 days, two weeks, um, we have no materials yet available that will eliminate it. And uh, therefore, if you uh, if you uh, pump blood for a longer period of time, utilizing these materials, these changes will take place. Well, mostly they are plastic materials of various kinds. Uh, and some, uh, well, these are plastic, silicone rubbers and things of that sort. How much money is the federal government spending Big pardon? How much money are you getting from the federal government? Well, the federal government appropriates about seven and a half million dollars a year for the total program. For the total program? Yeah. That's a very small amount of money. One submarine costs about $150 well, you see, this is why I think the public uh, has to make some uh, some priorities and values. Yeah, that's right. And yet, uh, there are a million people, a million Americans in this country will die this year from heart disease. And uh, perhaps uh, 20 million or more will suffer the disabilities of heart disease. Now, as far as I'm concerned, there's something wrong with our values when uh, we let that go on and, and spend only, the federal government, for example, spends something like $160 million for all research in all of heart disease. Oh yes. Well, I don't know. I uh, I think that uh, the evidence for that is uh, is not very good. You know, uh, it's 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 awful easy to statistically relate many things to um, let's say the development of heart disease. But the reason it's easy to do that is because we don't know the cause. <laughs> you know, and when you don't know the cause of anything, it's easy to speculate. That's why it's so important to... Do you drink, do you drink tea or coffee? Uh, both. <laughs> Doctor, you mentioned... But in moderation. I think it's important to do all of these things in moderation. Doctor, you mentioned that... Uh, Not because they cause heart trouble, <laughs> but for other reasons. Like I think it's important to avoid being overweight. Do you smoke? No. Uh, I don't think smoking is good for you either. Uh, but these are things that I think the individual ought to uh, ought to do because of uh, respect for his body and for good health, and it's important to maintain it. And I think you ought to maintain it. You ought to avoid things that are that hurt your health. How about jogging? Yeah, well, jogging is uh, if you know it's, it just happens to be a kind of a fashion right now, but. Exercise is good, and uh, it's important to maintain a, a, a certain amount of regular exercise, whether it be jogging or horse riding or swimming or whatever you want to do that you enjoy doing in moderation. That's right. You mentioned that Dacron was used in the for the repair of uh, aneurysms. Uh, doesn't yeah. that create the uh, same problem as an artificial heart would uh, material one? Yes, uh, it does. But you see, uh, what happens there is that the body, uh, as time goes on, builds uh, a lining of its own. Now, that's easy to do when you have a fixed tube that isn't moving. 
But, in a, but to, to do this with a pump is extremely difficult because it's, it's, it's got, we've not yet devised a pump that doesn't move. You see? <laughs> Well, that's been the problem. Can you say after a certain period of time that the donated heart actually becomes a person's heart? I mean, every no. cell is replaced. Or no. Something. You can never say that. No. There's always problems. That's there. right. This is true in the kidney. and it's, We've had the same problem in the kidneys, you see. We've had a much longer experience with them. In the artificial heart, do you try to perhaps have a, a layer of tissue from the recipient uh, lying the inside of the heart? Yes, but we've not been successful in doing this. This is one of the ideas we've tried to pursue in our research work. We haven't achieved it. What are the problems with that? Well, the main problem, again, is in the motion. You say? Do you have any legal problems uh, concerning taking out organs of uh, people that are dead? No, we've had no legal problems at all, really. Um, because um, we have the authorization, legal authorization, of the next of kin, uh, a family that's responsible. No, so as, as I understand that in observing the surgery there on the heart, actually you're not replacing a whole heart. You're actually leaving a left and right part of the left and right ventricle of the old no, heart. No, right? oh, of the atrium. I mean, of the atrium. Yeah. The atrium, what, that is not part of the heart? Yes. That's, well, that's part of the heart. Yes. So actually, you are not removing all facets of that heart. No. No. And, and, then, and then you're adjoining the, uh, yes. the atrium. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why don't they leak? Big pardon? Why doesn't it leak? So, oh. I it together, but how come it doesn't leak when you saw Because the blood seals it off. Blood, uh, uh, <coughs> at the site of an asmosis, there's a a certain amount of clotting that takes place uh, at that uh, uh, junction. And that, that clotted blood seals it all, and it doesn't leak. In the same fashion, if you cut your finger here, you know, cut your hand, made an incision here, and you and put it together, it'll bleed for a while, and then it stops bleeding. And the reason it does is because of blood clots. And then it seals it, and that's how healing takes place. Big hey, point. Caught throughout the horn. Just, just after the surgery, if you've got someone else's focus of blood is matched or something. Yeah, it's matched. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why, why can't you remove the whole heart? Why do you have to leave, leave part right. of the AIDS cell? Because it's easier to do. Oh. It's easier to attach it that way, oh, technically. Then, then it would be we, could, we could remove it, but, but it just makes it easier to do, oh. technically. Eventually fade away, and there's mm -hmm. some sort of tissue formed. That's right. It's replaced by fibrous tissue. Dr. Vicky, are you still? Uh, you were a pioneer in the artery, arterial surgery yes. in the body. Yes. Yes. Uh, and I know at one time there were very few doctors in the country doing this. In fact, I know someone had the surgery, and they had a right to you to get a name of a doctor. Mm -hmm. Who mm -hmm. Are there more doctors? Oh yes. Oh right? yes. Lots more. Thank goodness. Lots more. And they're, oh yes, we've trained, we have trained a lot of them ourselves, and now some of the people we've trained are training others. This is a great thing about it. Oh, that's great. Sir, would it be beneficial to the medical profession and also to the recipient uh, of the body that is donated to, uh, to science or to the uh, uh, research where the, uh, where the good part, functioning part, example, I guess, kidneys, which functions well, but there's a damage in the, in the lung and also in the heart that has been damaged. Yes, yes. Particularly from an elderly person. Yes. Uh, would it have advantages? Well, I think it would, yes. I think that this is uh, implicit in the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act that uh, we're trying to uh, promote, you know so that the individual has the right to make that decision. You see, the way it is now, legally, uh, once a person dies, he no longer has control over his body, he so becomes the property of the next of kin. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yes, I think it's good. I think it does. Mm -hmm. If you have several recipients and uh, a limited amount of donors, how do you decide who among the recipients gets it? 
Well, no, uh, we have not had this problem. Theoretically, it would be a problem if we had a lot of donors and a lot of recipients available for that purpose. But the trouble is that this doesn't this doesn't happen because statistically it would uh, it would require you know tremendous numbers for that sort of thing to happen. The the primary factor is in the match the matching, and this limits our. We were this was an extraordinary situation where the matching for all four of them occurred the way it did. So, so far, this has not come up. You had the choice to make between whether, uh, assuming there were three people that matched, would you pick the one that could have the best chance of surviving or the one who needed it the most? Well, we usually, in, in other situations of this kind, when we have a decision to make of this kind, we try to make the decision on the basis of which patient is most urgent in, in, in need of help. Isn't one of the reasons why some of these operations fail is because the man is in, in poor health, let's say, uh, generally? But that's true in almost any serious operation. Yeah. If we took that into consideration, we would eliminate the possibility of helping a lot of people that we can help. So, uh, but, and I don't think that's been, in a sense, the main cause of the deaths that have taken place. Uh, it's perhaps a contributing factor. But if a patient is not, not very sick, you know, then he doesn't need the operation to begin with. Much better than not to take the risk of the operation. So we only are willing to take the risk in patients who are deathly ill nothing else to do for them, you see. And if they, if, if they don't come through, uh, you can't just blame it on the fact that they were that deathly ill. That was the basis for doing it to begin with, right. you see. Are they doing anything in South Africa? You don't hear anything more of uh, no. the and any of the surgeries. I think he's too busy traveling. Yeah. Lyberg, <laughs> was that just an accident of fate that he's living this long? It seems to be uh, certainly, certainly uh, they extraordinary. Yeah, they didn't do all that matching then. No, as as they no. Do now. that's right. He's very, very uh, lucky. Certainly. As he said, though, it's much, sometimes better to be lucky than smart. <laughs> Usually, when a man has had a bad heart for a certain period of time, uh, don't his other organs uh, suffer? Yeah. To some extent mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. That's right. But they also have a chance of coming back. Oh. Yeah. We have uh, time for about uh, two more questions, and I know you've been wanting to ask one. So I'm All right. In the, in the yeah. <laughs> you say that the far-reaching goal is to have it so that uh, you don't have to make That's right. Uh, how do you go about, like, going after this goal? You know, oh, well, the, res the research I'm, res I'm referring to is concerned with the effort to understand better the cause of arteriosclerosis, which is the basic cause of most of these diseases, so-called hardening of the arteries. Actually, it's not always hardening, sometimes it's softening. But that's what I'm referring to. That's what we're trying to find out. Yeah. Uh, I had a question. I noticed in 21st century, they're giving uh, blood transfusions to infants now, mm -hmm. and it's so that they'd be uh, receptible to any type of blood transfusion. Mm -hmm. Would this make them, as they grow up and they needed an organ transplant, would it make them more receptive so that they would have hardly any complications? No. You know, they still have the ability to develop a, because it, it's uh, the immune factor. You, you see, it's not a, an effort to remove the uh, immune response uh, because if we did that, then we'd make people susceptible to all kinds of infections too. We can't afford to do that. That's the dilemma you're in in the rejection phenomenon. Uh, if you suppress the immune response too much, in the effort to prevent the rejection of the organism, then you suppress the ability to tolerate infections. And that's why some of the patients die. In fact, there are a good many of them die from infection. They can't control the infection. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.